My name is Deepak Srivastava, and I direct the Gladstone Institute of Cardiovascular Disease and the Roddenberry Stem Cell Center at Gladstone, and I'm a professor at the University of California in San Francisco. Today I'd like to share with you a story that illustrates how we can begin to use knowledge we gain from studying developmental biology, so early embryonic development, to understand the causes of human diseases and even find new therapeutics for human diseases. And I'll largely focus on diseases of the heart, but I'd like to highlight the fact that the principles I'll share with you could be applied to many different organs and many different human diseases. So I have a background as a pediatric cardiologist, and the disease that I take care of is illustrated here, which is a child, a newborn, who was born with a heart defect, where during embryonic development, this baby's heart just failed to form properly in the right three-dimensional shape. And as a result, uh, the, after birth, the child had a number of problems and required very early surgery, as you can see here. And this type of problem is extremely common. Heart defects occur in 1% of all live births worldwide. Uh, and despite our best efforts at surgical intervention, which have now become quite good, it remains the leading non-infectious cause of death in the first year of life. So we have to understand this disease better and uh, in the future, hopefully treat them in a different way, uh, both through preventive measures, but as well as uh, treatments that could change the natural history of this disease over time. Now, it's been our hope that if we understood how nature normally forms a heart in an embryo, that it might inform us about this disease, but it also might inform us about a different kind of heart disease, and that's the type of heart disease that occurs in adults, which is very different from what I just mentioned to you. So in adults, heart disease across the world now is the leading cause of death. Just within the United States, there are over one million people every year who have heart attacks. And because we're doing better and better with saving those individuals, uh, the problem has been that they are saved, but they have damage to their heart. And as a result of that damage, there are now five to six million people who are living in the United States who suffer from what we call heart failure, where the pump, just because of the damage, can't pump well enough to support the circulation in the body. And if you look worldwide, that number is about 24 million. So it's an enormous health problem. And right now, we have very few approaches that are, can address this disease, and none that are actually curative. Because at the end of the day, if you've lost heart muscle from damage, the only real way to fix that is to create new heart muscle, so to regenerate the heart. And right now, we don't have any ways to do that. And what I'm going to show you is that possibly by using the clues from nature of how it normally makes a heart, that in this situation, we might be able to create new heart muscle for this disease. So the themes of what I'll share with you today are, one, to understand how early cardiac sulfate decisions are made in the embryo as it's first forming. And that uh, involves both uh, understanding signaling pathways that impinge on these decisions, transcriptional networks that establish these various sulfates, and even translational networks that are embedded in these pathways using microRNAs that then titrate the right dose of these networks to exert the proper outcome. And then the second thing, theme that we'll talk about is how we can utilize these knowledge of these networks and overlay them on human genetic models to begin to understand the basis of human disease and not only understand the genetics of those disease, but also understand the mechanisms using induced pluripotent stem cells in a dish. And finally, I'll share with you how we can use these developmental biology networks to reprogram cells in situ in an organ for regenerative medicine. So all of this work starts by going back to the ba basics of how does an organ form in utero. And for what I'm showing you here, these are the steps that we know of that are involved in a heart forming early during embryogenesis. And so we know that as early as two weeks after fertilization in, the, in a human embryo, there are cells, like you see here, that begin to align themselves in this crescent shape. 
And already at this stage, before there are any organs in the body, these cells already know that they're going to become heart muscle in the future. And even at this stage, they're already parsed into different pools of progenitors that I've highlighted here in either red, purple, or yellow. And these cells go on to form specific parts of the adult heart. And in particular, you can see that these yellow cells uh, align themselves in this back, back of this tube that forms at about three weeks after, of, after fertilization. This tube starts beating. And then these yellow cells come into the top and form the, what's going to become later the right ventricle of the heart. And the red cells form the left ventricle. So already, we're beginning to see that there are different pools of progenitor cells that will give rise to different chambers of the mature heart. And this begins to explain a, a, an observation we've had in pediatric cardiology for a long time. And that is that children are often born where there are defects in just one part of the heart, but the rest of the heart is normal. So for instance, a child might be born missing their whole left ventricle or missing their whole right ventricle, and the rest of the heart is fine. And so now we can begin to understand why that might be, because you can imagine that there might be a mutation in a gene that was critical for these yellow cells to form, but not the red, or vice versa. And then if you have that mutation, you'd lose only that part of the heart, but not the rest of the heart. And so we've learned a lot about this process at the molecular level by using a variety of model organisms, including fruit flies, zebrafish, chick embryos, mouse and mouse embryos. And collectively in our field, we now know quite a bit about the key genes that drive the events that you see on this slide. But animal models turned out to be very difficult to use to get at the earliest cell fate decisions that occur uh, in the first two weeks uh, of life, as I mentioned earlier. And for understanding that process, we as a field have turned to the pluripotent stem cell system in a dish, where we can take pluripotent stem cells and guide them along a path in a stepwise fashion, like you see here, where they become mesodermal progenitors. And those mesodermal progenitors become uh, these multipotent cardiac progenitors. And we can even mimic the different pools of progenitors in cells in a dish here. So those red and yellow cells we can isolate in the dish. And the yellow cells are very similar to those in vivo, where they are multipotent. They be can become cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, or smooth muscle cells. And so we've uh, utilized this system to work out the intricacies of how these stepwise decisions are made at the earliest time points to tell an early cell that it's going to become a cardiac progenitor and then become a cardiomyocyte or an endothelial cell or a smooth muscle cell. And together, by using animal models and stem cells in a dish, we, as a field, have developed a quite deep understanding of the gene networks that are dictating cardiac cell fate and subsequent morphogenesis. So we know a lot and maybe know most of the players that are critical. And we're still trying to figure out the exact mechanisms by which each of these critical essential players are actually uh, exerting their effect. And currently, we now have the tools to do that uh, in biology that we couldn't even do actually just a few years ago. So we've known enough to know what the key players are. And so we've begun to ask, are these gene networks that we have discovered the ones that are, in fact, disrupted in the setting of human disease? And the answer to that turns out to be, as it's evolving, is that, yes, these are indeed the key genes that are disrupted. So what I'm showing you here are a subset of the key gene networks that are involved in controlling those yellow cells, the red cells, the blue cells at the top. And each of, most of the genes on this slide are transcription factors that are playing key roles. And we can begin to arrange them in a, in a hierarchical network, like what you see here. And what's been satisfying is that each of these gene networks is hit one or more times with mutations in humans. And I've indicated those mutations, those genes that are mutated by asterisk in this slide. And uh, what I want to 
to emphasize here is that in every one of these cases, the gene mutations are actually heterozygous mutations. So only one of the two copies in the genome are mutated. And in many cases, the one that's mutated is not even a loss, complete loss of function mutation, but maybe only a single amino acid that's changed. So we've, it's a hypomorph. We've only reduced the dosage of that key gene or its, and its network a little bit. But that's enough to get over the disease threshold. And so what that tells us is that the dosage of these networks is, is exquisitely controlled in a very precise mash, fashion. But it also suggests that if we can just increase the dosages of these networks a little bit, we might someday get over the disease threshold. And so the hurdle might not be so high to actually prevent some of these diseases. That gives us hope that our understanding of this process might actually lead to some prevent, preventive measures in the future. Now, our laboratory had, in specifically, had identified uh, years ago mutations in a, a very important developmental gene called NOTCH1 that causes valve disorders. And we've also identified mutations in another transcription factor called GATA4, which is very important for formation of the septum of the heart, so the walls that divide the different chambers of the heart. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time sharing with you some of the things we've learned recently about the mechanism by which this heterozygous mutation actually causes human disease. Because at the end of the day, just identifying the genes that are mutated doesn't get us that much further to a therapy. We have to understand the mechanism by which these mu gene mutations cause disease. Before I do that, I want to also highlight the fact that we are now able to do, generate exomes of thousands of individuals with disease. And in an effort uh, through a national heart, lung, and blood uh, sponsored consortium, we and others have found that there are, in fact, a number of genes uh, that are involved in congenital heart disease. And in most cases, those mutations are also heterozygous mutations. And so from the mutations I described to you before and the ones that we're beginning to find now through exome sequencing, uh, as I mentioned, if we really want to understand the mechanism in a human cell, uh, we've got to have human cells in front of us to study. And for many years, we tried to understand the mechanism by making mouse models of these mutations. And we learned some things. But at the end of the day, most mice that were heterozygous for these mutations were fine. The threshold in mice turned out to be very different than in humans. And so the key uh, advance that has allowed us to now begin to understand mechanism uh, has been the discovery uh, by our colleague here, Shinya Yamanaka, of induced pluripotent stem cells. So Dr. Yamanaka found that we could take fibroblast or blood cells from an adult and introduce just four critical genes. And those genes were enough to reprogram those cells into something that looked and behaved just like a human embryonic stem cell in that they were pluripotent. And he termed these iPS cells, or induced pluripotent stem cells. And this discovery opened up the possibility that we might be able to take stem cells, make stem cells from a patient, and use those cells for regenerative medicine by transplanting them back into the patient because they'd be genetically identical. And that, there are many efforts to do that, but that's still years away. But what is happening now with this technology, and I'll share with you an example of this, is generating these cells from an individual with a genetic mutation, and then turning those pluripotent cells into the cell type that's, that you want to study the disease. And then you can now have billions of cells in front of you that you can now study that has the genetic mutation that's causing disease in a patient. And now you can finally begin to interrogate those cells and really get at the nitty gritty of why did that mutation in that patient cause a problem in the cells that are now suffering from disease. So this was a real breakthrough that allowed us to make the progress that I'll share with you. So if you want to do that for any cell type, the first thing you have to do is be able to generate large numbers of the cells that are affected by disease. So what you're seeing here is a sheet of cells that used to be on somebody's skin, but now have been transformed into a, a syncytium or a sheet of beating cells that are all beating synchronously. 
and these are human IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. We've become very good at making these, and we can make uh, full billions of these cells with 90% pure uh, cultures of, of these cells. And so we've done this now for the human disease that I mentioned to you, uh, where we've had this mutation in this critical gene, GATA4, that's absolutely essential for normal development uh, in the heart in an embryo. And so what you see here is the family that we uh, took care of and studied some years ago that spans five generations. Everybody who has this single amino acid switch from a glycine to serine at position 296 in GATA4, which is a transcription factor, has the disease. And while we had uh, identified this gene mutation many years ago, this is an example of where we got stuck by just studying the mice, because the mice that were heterozygous were pretty much OK and didn't have a lot of the disease manifestations. But what we did uh, think a few years ago is that this point mutation might be causing a problem of the ability of this protein to interact with another protein called TBX5. And the reason we thought that might be the case is that humans with mutations in TBX5 have the same problem that humans with GATA4 have, which is they, that they get holes in their heart or septal defects. And the amino acid that's affected in this protein is shown here, and it sits right next to a zinc finger in GATA4 that's very critical for protein-protein interactions. And so if we made, when we made this mutation of GATA4 and overexpressed this mutant protein in a non-cardiomyocyte years ago, we could show that it doesn't, GATA4 does in fact interact with TBX5, and this mutation breaks apart that interaction. But what we didn't know is does that really happen on DNA in a human cardiomyocyte when they're at their normal levels? And, uh, and what I'll show you is that, in fact, they do, and we've been able to experimentally show that and understand why that would cause trouble. So this is a, a heart from one of the family members with, uh, that I showed you before that does not have the GATA4 mutation. It's like a normal heart. It's an ultrasound where you see the uh, left ventricle is here, the right ventricle is here, and these chambers are pumping normally. What we found is these patients with the GATA4 mutation not only had holes in their heart, but as some of the kids got older, they ended up having a different problem. And here's an ultrasound of one of those kids who's now a teenager. And uh, what I'd like you to appreciate is that here in the right ventricle, you see a lot of white stuff here. That white stuff should not be there. It should be black, which is meaning an empty uh, cavity full of blood. Instead, there's a lot of muscle fibers that are invading into the cavity of this ventricular chamber. And the heart's not pumping as hard as it should. And so uh, this is a problem that's often thought of as a problem reflecting immaturity of the muscle cells. And so we thought we might actually be able to see if that's happening in their IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. So we've generated IPS cells from these family members that are shown here, eight individuals, four with the mutation and four without. And uh, we took skin biopsies from these individuals, transformed them into stem cells, and then into the beating cardiomyocytes like I showed you earlier. And uh, when we made these cells, which were done by uh, two talented trainees in the laboratory, Jensen Ang, uh, postdoc, and Renee Rivas, an MD, PhD student, uh, they made these iPS cells and looked at the RNA of these, uh, of these cardiomyocytes. And it turns out that if you make iPS-derived cardiomyocytes from all eight of these individuals and try to compare the mutant ones with the mutation and ones without, there's a lot of noise in the system because each one is a little bit different. And so the real breakthrough that allowed us to get to the next level came with the advance in technology of gene editing. So by using CRISPR technology, we could go into these iPS cells and just, in the patients who have the mutation, correct that mutation so that everything else in the genome is the same except for this one nucleotide change. And so we call these isogenic controls. And now when you compare the isogenic controls with the ones that 
have a mutation and everything else is the same, then everything displayed itself because the noise went away. And so what we, then we were able to really figure things out that I'll show you in the next few slides. So the first thing we wanted to know is can we in fact recapitulate the problem of the muscle being uh, immature and having trouble contracting in these cells even though they started off on somebody's skin. And uh, to do that, we used a system we developed in collaboration with Beth Pruitt's lab where we can uh, grow these cardiomyocytes not in the dish in the culture like I showed you before, but rather have each muscle cell in an individual well by itself uh, in a pattern, these pattern micro wells uh, that are indicated here. So here, each of these uh, colored areas you see is a single cell in a well, and we, these cells can beat, and we can actually measure the, their force of contraction as individual cells. And so we've done that uh, for a number of cells. So in this graph, each of these dots represents a single cell and the force they generate. And in the red cells are the ones with mutation compared to the ones without. And you can see that the force generation by these mutant cells is less than the ones that don't have the mutation. So in fact, we're able to recapitulate some aspect of this uh, cardiac dysfunction in this artificial system. So we then looked at uh, the transcriptome of these cells. Since this is a transcription factor mutation, uh, we wanted to know how the transcriptional output was different. So what you're seeing here is a heat map of the genes that are downregulated with this mutation and those that are upregulated. And what you'll notice is that there are a number of, about a third of the genes were downregulated. And if you look at the GO terms or gene ontology terms uh, that characterize those genes that are downregulated, it looks like this. There's, it's enriched for genes involved in heart development, cardiac chamber, morphogenesis, contraction. So all the genes that are that should normally be turned on so that this muscle cell knows it should beat vigorously and turn into a heart are decreased. And in contrast, if you look at the large, even larger number of genes that are apparently upregulated and look at the GO terms there, this is really quite interesting. There are a whole host of genes that are involved in vascular or endocardial development that are now up that should have been shut off. And so somehow, just because of this single heterozygous point mutation, there's a whole host of genes that should have been shut off that now aren't. So why, why is that? So to answer that, we began to look at where do, do these uh, genes, TBX5 and GATA4, normally sit, and how might that disruption actually cause the problem. And so what I'm showing you here is the CHIP, chromatin immunoprecipitation, or CHIP, seq sequencing data of GATA4, where it sits on DNA, TBX5, and where it sits on DNA, and a histone mark, H3K27 acetylation, which marks uh, active enhancers. And what you'll see is that in, in these areas here that are blue, which indicate uh, where GATA4 normally sits on DNA, which each horizontal line representing a single genomic locus where GATA4 is binding to DNA, uh, if you look at the comparable areas where TBX5 sits, about half of the places where GATA4 sits across the whole genome, it's sitting there with GATA4. So these are really obligate partners throughout the genome, and they're, it's, sense, it's essential for those to interact at those sites. Um, and if we look at this more broadly and look at the sites across the genome where these two proteins are co-bound, uh, in the wild-type setting, they're about... 2,500 spots, and uh, there's, in, it turns out that in the setting of this point mutation, about half of those indicated in blue here are lost. So with this mutation, at, at about half the sites where GATA4 normally sits on the DNA with TBX5, its partner, it no longer can because of this point mutation. And if you go a step further and ask, what are these genes where this interaction is lost? What types of genes are they? and look at the GO terms of those, again, it's those genes that are most important for contraction of the heart muscle, for the heart to form, for congenital heart defects to occur. And so this begins to explain why this point mutation in GATA4 
is actually causing uh, the cardiomyopathy and the congenital heart defects at a very fundamental level of its inability to now control transcription in the proper way uh, in the human genome. So this is an example of the power that uh, this uh, approach can bring to understanding the mechanisms uh, by which this disease occurs. Now, I've told you so far about how we can use this to understand why a muscle cell might not contract normally. But what about the three-dimensional aspect of this disease, where you have holes in the heart? When we set out, it, it, we thought this might be really difficult because it's a two-dimensional system of these IPS-derived cardiomyocytes, yet we're trying to model a three-dimensional, understand a three-dimensional problem. What I'm going to share with you in the next uh, couple of slides is the, how I, we believe that we've actually uh, been able to decipher the mechanism of this three-dimensional defect despite having a two-dimensional system, which we think bodes well for other forms, other types of disease modeling for morphogenetic defects. So to do that, I first need to give you a little bit of background in uh, one aspect of developmental biology. And that is that early during development, um, there is a signal that comes uh, from the pulmonary endoderm, which when the heart's forming early in an embryo, uh, this pulmonary endoderm sits right behind the developing heart, right next to it. And it secretes uh, a very important morphogen called sonic hedgehog, which is involved in development of many different organs. The neighboring cardiac muscle has to receive that sonic hedgehog signal, and in response to that sonic hedgehog signal, actually forms this atrial septum that you see here. And the sonic hedgehog signal is received by a receptor on the muscle cells called patched, and it leads to a series of intracellular events that is mediated by a transcription factor called glee in the nucleus, and that then uh, ha helps the muscle cell respond to the sonic hedgehog signal and then grow this septum. And we know that if you uh, delete sonic hedgehog from the pulmonary endoderm, you end up with mouse hearts that don't have a septum. And if you delete glee from the cardi mus cardiac muscle cells, you also get holes in the heart in a mouse. And the reason I'm telling you this is that it turns out that in our IPS-derived cardiomyocytes with this GATA4 mutation, we found that sonic hedgehog, the machinery in the cardiomyocyte to receive the sonic hedgehog signal was downregulated broadly. And in particular, the receptor patch 1 and patch 2 were severely downregulated, and the transcriptional mediators GLEE2 and GLEE3 were also downregulated. So what we think is happening here is that in the setting of this mutation, where GATA4 and TBX5 should normally sit at those regulatory regions to turn on uh, patched and GLEE, they don't. And so now you get down regulation. And so even though the sonic hedgehog signal is coming from the lung, developing lung, it can't be received properly in the developing heart, thus resulting in this defect. And so what we think is going on in this setting, setting and what we've learned by uh, going from the developmental biology, understanding the genetic mutation, and then modeling in ips drive cells is that normally, GATA4 and TBX5 have to broadly across the genome sit at parts of the DNA to robustly turn on cardiac genes. And at the same time, they have to sit at other sites across the genome, like endothelial or endocardial genes, and actively shut off those regions by recruiting co-repressors in data that I didn't show you, but we found that this is an active process, and that has to happen for normal development. And in the setting of a human condition, where all you've done is made this protein unable to recruit its cofactor, that now we see a situation where there's aberrant downregulation broadly of cardiac genes and aberrant upregulation of other genes uh, that should be shut off and now aren't shut off, thus affecting the function and behavior of those muscle cells. So what I hope you can tell from this is, and this example could be applied to many, many other diseases, is that by deeply interrogating a human cell in a dish that has the mutation that causes disease and using gene editing approaches, we can really get at the nitty-gritty 
of why disease occurs. And now we have cells in the dish that we can use to screen for drugs that actually might reverse the problem that we've identified, and we're actively doing that now. So this is the end of the first part of my talk uh, related to how developmental biology can be used to understand human disease. And in the second part, I will talk about how we can use developmental biology gene networks for regenerative medicine. Thank you very much.